I think we're getting to a, to a reasonable uh, critical mass here. So thank you all for joining. Um, this is our, our second uh, instantiation of ML Whiteboard, which really started as an informal space for snorkelers to discuss the latest papers, techniques, workflows um, that you know we just really enjoy nerding out about. And, and we decided to open source it to make it uh, available to the broader community because you know that, that's really where our roots were, right? As an open source project, as a, a you know, a, a project that that's really kind of gotten a lot of feedback from from uh, folks in the broader community. So thank you, thank you uh, for for those in the audience who's who joined. Feel free to ask any questions, um, raise your hand, you, use all the Zoom features out there. But without further ado, um, today Hiromu, one of our ML engineers, is going to be uh, covering and, and summarizing a, a paper written by you know some some other snorkelers on the call, Dan Fu, Fred Sala. Uh, Around multi multi resolution week supervision um, for sequential and time series data, and so yeah, uh, Roma, why don't you take it away? And excited for the discussion. Yeah, um, Vincent, thank you for introduction. Uh, let me share my screen and get started. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, cool. So today I'll be reviewing a, a paper titled "Mass Resolution Week Supervision for Sequential Data." Uh, with a special guest, Dan Fu, and also uh, Fred, who are uh, original author of this paper, uh, because this deck is based upon my uh, understanding. So please correct me if I'm mistaken. So this is a paper uh, we are reviewing today. Uh, this was authored by Fred and Paroma, Jason Dung, and others, and presented at New Rips 2019. Uh, so here are the key takeaways. One, much resolution week supervision is common in sequential data, such as time series sensor data and video. And there are a variety of label models and the earlier version referred to as DP or data programming in the paper didn't work well on sequential data. And Jigon is the one that the paper proposed is a new label model that takes account of sequential correlations and sequential uh, distribution prior. And Jigon worked better on some sequential data set. Uh, and this is a table of contents. Um, I'm going to uh, describe what is much resolution with Spapijo in, in the first place. And then I'm going to be describing the label model or DP and why it doesn't work on sequential data. And as you go on, yet another label model for sequential data. So, what is much resolution with Spapijo in the first place? So, according to the paper, um, that's a supervision sources at uh, different resolutions. For example, given sequence with T elements, sources can assign a single label per element or per collection of elements or for the entire sequence. Let's look at this example task, which identifies interviews of Bernie Sanders from the large corpus of TV's, uh, TV news. Uh, the figure on the uh, bottom left shows a, a sequence of four frames so large T here is for in this example. And we have, you can imagine like a, these example sources. And um, the first example is actually a per frame. So this source can assign a labels per, per frame, whether each frame has blue background or not. Um, this table right here has a, a, a labels assigned by those sources at different resolution on frames or per, per window or per scene. So as an example, uh, this a, a source can assign true because it, it has a blue background. And this uh, second frame also has a blue background, um, but full false on this uh, third frame because it doesn't have a blue background and so on. And the second example source assigns labels per window. So each consecutive two frames like this, um, whether faces of each frame has the same size as previous frame because these two frames have maybe mostly exact same size because so it's T for true, but these two frames have different face sizes. We have a bigger size here, but smaller faces here. That's to be false and so on. The last example source assigns labels per scene. So one example source is a transcript starts with uh, joining me now or ends with thank you. And another example, such a, uh, such an example is a, a show title is State of the, on, State of the Union on CNN or not. So uh, please remember this particular column right here, which assigns a, a per frame labels on each frame, because I refer to this in, in a later slide. 
So uh, what's the label model and why it doesn't work? Um, so this is a label model, the, because basically it's a probability of uh, label Y given a, a, set, a set of sources, lambda, parameterized by uh, accuracy, new, and also uh, correlation psi. So this is the one that Fred talked about in a previous internal meeting. And its early version is referred to as the DP order the programming in the paper. And this label model is usually, but not always used for a single task. By single task, by, uh, I mean a label takes either spam or ham, for example. So it's very simple task. And also it's not, it's usually, but not always, but labeling functions are equal to sources. So for example, we have a domain expert here who writes uh, three living functions and we have a label model like this, uh, just a single layer. I have uh, three sources here and a single uh, a label. So single task, one layer, three sources, it's simple. And if you estimate these uh, accuracy and uh, correlations, we can get uh, probabilistic labels. And if you want, you can train an M model or discrete model. So that's that. Uh, why it doesn't work on much resolution? Um, so the paper discusses two reasons. One is that uh, label models may not be identifiable due to sequential correlations among sources. So this table right here is a, uh, um, the, each row represents scene and each column represents per frame sources. So if you can remember, this one right here is a transpose format of the last uh, in the slide um, column representation of labels. So uh, um, like a per frame source on, on frame one, two, two, four, two, that was a blue background, if you can remember. Uh, similarly, you can have labels on scene two and other scenes as well. Because a video scene tends to have the same background color throughout the scene, because uh, the first scene, if the first frame has a blue background, it stays the same throughout the uh, scene. Also, uh, if the first frame has, doesn't have a blue background, it stays, uh, it stays the same towards the end. So as a result, so these sources become highly correlated, which prevents a label model from converging to a unique solution. So that's number one reason that why it doesn't work on much resolution um, with supervision. The second reason is that, so this label model right here has no way to incorporate uh, distribution prior. For example, how frames within interviews are distributed within a scene. Um, intuitively, we can imagine that Bernie Sanders would appear all four frames or none of the frames rather than just the two first frames or the last two frames or a single frame or like random uh, frames. If the model, if the label model takes this uh, uh, account of this sequence distribution prior, it will work better on sequential data. That's a motivation to come up and work on this Jugon, another, yet another uh, label model for sequential data. So according to the paper, um, this Jugon is a first weak supervision framework that does two things. Um, one is it integrates much resolution supervision sources of varying quality. That is much task of different resolutions. Much task means a, a different resolution per, per, per frame or per window or per sequence. It has different uh, task labels, like a Y1 for frame one or Y sequence for the entire sequence. And also uh, probabilistic graph models have layers at uh, each resolution. Um, in, the, in the previous slide, we have just one single layer, but we have a, uh, a much layers for different uh, resolutions. One graphical model for task and the another graphical model for sources. And the second uh, feature is that it incorporates distribution prior to generate high quality training labels for sequential data. So that's Jugon, and this is the end-to-end -end pipeline for Jugons. So we have a, this input and sequence data of T elements. Uh, again, this uh, T is four in this example and N number of sources. We have three logic but, or three living functions, but N number of sources, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And also we have to provide uh, distribution prior and also graphical models uh, for, for task and sources. This is actually a combined uh, graphical model for these two a graphical models. And 
uh, uh, we train a, a label model to go on and we get a probabilistic labels. Uh, in this case, we have probabilistic labels for a per frame uh, resolution. And then if you want, you can train a M model, this training model. So um, these are the data set that K paper used for experiments. Uh, they're all sequential data from MRI images, uh, videos, or TV news, or sensor data, and movies and videos. And they're all binary tasks. Uh, one example is uh, to classify congenital heart defect or identify interviews of Barney Sanders and so on. So this is the data set. Uh, this is a result. So the table right here compares uh, a different labeling strategies. This is a uh, traditional supervision and this is a majority vote. This is a DP or earlier version of label model. And this is Jugon on five different data set. Uh, this is uh, F1 uh, scores, okay? And Jugon outperforms DP by 24.2 F1 points on average. But if you look at these uh, closely, Jugon outperforms DP well on some tasks, for example, interviews and basketball but performs the same on others, like for example, uh, VAV or MRI images or gate or shot. Okay. <clears throat> this is another perspective of the result uh, because DP or data programming, the, the earlier version label model doesn't, uh, doesn't assume any distribution prior. Their positive prediction could appear at any element. It seems like this was the case in this example, but Jugon has, a, a mechanism to incorporate distribution prior, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, has a me me mechanism to incorporate distribution prior. Uh, it captures uh, sort of um, very good um, positive prediction with respect to grand truth labels. So uh, again, this is a key takeaways as a recap. Uh, Metro resolution weak supervision is common in sequential data such as time series sensor data and video and their variety of label models. And DP is one of them and didn't work on sequential data. And Jigon is a yet, yet another new, <coughs> excuse me, new label model that takes account of these two, uh, two features to work on better on sequential data set. Um, that was basically my end of my presentation, but here we have a, my questions uh, to the authors um, in the order of my preference. Like, um, Vincent, how do I start? Uh, I can start yeah, asking why this don't question. We, I guess if Dan or Fred, y'all you, you have anything you want to add at a high level, um, we're happy to just riff on this. And then, Karuma, these are great. Um, maybe we'll we'll weave them in as a as appropriate. Yeah, uh, I guess to to just you know provide some color on kind of like the the research. Um, I think the thing that we really took away from this experience in this paper was uh, incorporating that temporal prior. Um, because uh, I, I think the thing that we learned about kind of working with sequential data is that uh, sometimes it's really easy to write labeling functions that kind of apply on single frames. Um, sometimes it's easier for, to write them like applying over sequences and uh, having that, that, that knob to kind of just uh, you know, play with the, um, the, the sequential prior was, was really important. Um, there's, there's two examples that I like uh, one uh, was shot detection in movies versus something like interviews. So um, I, I don't think I, that there were any good figures, but um, so in shot detection, uh, the nature of that task. Uh, so th that task, the way it works is you're like watching a film and every now and then the camera will, yeah, will cut from like one angle to another. Um, and the task is to detect like the exact frame where that cut happens. So they're like, you have some sequence of frames and you want to like find the exact frame where something happens. Um, and so your prior is like, uh, there's like no cut for some amount of frames and it's cut on one frame and there's no cut uh, compared to like TV news interviews where you're interviewing someone for like 10 minutes at a time. Um, so that's just, you know, 10 minutes of frames all in a row um, where, where you're, it's basically the, the same task. Um, and you might actually end up like writing labeling functions that maybe kind of look similar or somewhat similar. Um, and just being able to, uh, you know, incorporate that, that prior and say in this setting, like I know that it should be no, 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 yes, no, 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 no. And in this other setting it should just be like, yes, 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 for like 10 minutes in a row. 
Um, I, I think that's what we kind of took away as like being, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest thing uh, in, in this paper. That's very useful information. Um, like a, ha having prior distribution was a key element to, to better work on this sequential data. Um, that makes me think like, uh, for example, one of the tasks we are working on is actually anomaly detection. Anomaly could happen at any time in, in, a, in, a, in a sequence. Do you have any idea how we, can, we could tackle this anomaly detection in a sequence, which could happen at any element, maybe no distribution prior to such a, such a task? Uh, I think I'd have to, you know, hear more about what the, you know, exact task is. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not too familiar with what you mean by an anomaly, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I'd imagine that you can probably like do, do something at least like, yeah, I, 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 I think I really need to like be able to speak more about like what an anomaly is. Like, is it something that happens over like an hour at a time or is like a blip in your thing? Um, or something. I'm, yeah, I, I'm not too sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, something like this could, could potentially help. Um, I, I think the other thing is, uh, uh, one of the things that we didn't quite address in this paper is that that Dugong column is like super slow, <laughs> um, because you're, you're modeling all these like temporal correlations. Um, and, uh, I think we, we ended up having some follow-up work with like flying squid and stuff like that, where we, made it way faster and you know get the same accuracy um, but because we solved the label model in a different way we were able to like uh, solve it almost instantaneously and there you can just start playing around and iterating a lot faster um, with some of those questions about the priors and things like that yeah regarding like a computational time complexity i actually asked this question to a friend and Parama why we have only five for, for, for T. And the answer was uh, computational co complexity when we writing the paper and also doing this experiment. They, that's related to this a, a question right here. So it was limited to five due to the co computation time comp uh, com complexity of the early version Jugon. And you said uh, uh, you ended up uh, tuning the uh, how to uh, compute the label model and the uh, estimate how it, did you get a chance to rely on this experiment and get a consistent result? Um, right, so we, uh, Dugong actually doesn't run with T greater than five on a standard GPU. I see. <laughs> um, so we, we didn't do it with Dugong, but with Flying Squid, which is kind of like the follow-up work. Um, oh, I see. I think that the name of that paper is like Fast and Furious or some crazy title like that. Uh, we, we were able to get like larger T um, and, uh, in some cases that, you know, result in better performance in other cases, like the, the signals kind of all there to begin with. So, so we didn't need necessarily the larger T, um, but even like T equals five, like with Dugong, we'll take, uh, some, uh, I, I actually don't remember how long it takes, uh, but it takes like, you know, GPU cycles just to run the label model with flying squid. It was, uh, basically all CPU, um, and it ran, ran super fast. Yeah. Yeah, I have a follow-up question there. Could you speak a little bit more to, you know, it sounds like this was a great proof of concept and some of the follow-on where you, you were able to speed things up. What, did that lead to new applications or new workflows that that actually made it easier to, you know, iteratively, iteratively uh, develop these sorts of applications? Like what, what were the, what were some of the downstream effects of, of that specific performance optimization? Yeah, I think uh, a big mode switch actually was uh, not needing, so Flying Squid, uh, the, the initial implementation that we had basically all runs in like NumPy code or like, or like PyTorch, like some simple matrix uh, multiplication. So the result is you can actually run it on CPU. Um, so uh, at some point when we were, you know, uh, starting up so some of those projects, we were actually able to have people just iterate on their laptops super fast. Um, whereas with something like Dugong, that was never really an option because uh, the way that we solved the label model, you needed to run a GPU. Um, and uh, you know, when I, you know, you're just uh, working with some undergrads who uh, maybe don't have the best hardware available, uh, it's, it's a bit challenging to be like, okay, go, go get your own GPU and 
uh, to, to run this code base. Whereas with Flying Squid, you can just you know, whip up a Jupyter notebook, start playing around with your labeling functions immediately, um, start get that like immediate iteration uh, and kind of seeing how they perform. And that lets you, you know, tune your label functions a lot faster, tune all the other hyperparameters a lot faster. Um, and you know, just just iterate faster. That's awesome. I can jump in also with kind of my my thoughts about this paper. Thanks a lot, Hiromu, for the description. This is really great, and it brings back good memories of working on this with Dan and all you folks. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the the biggest takeaway here is along the lines of if you choose to model everything in a very general way, things will often work, but you'll be a little bit inefficient. And that's the reason why all those DP results aren't as good as they could be. Um, over there, if you're not really thinking of the sequential nature of the problem, you can sort of ignore it and make every frame something different. But then you like lose all of that sequential information, and that's very costly, so you won't do well. Alternatively, you could take the whole sequence and make like one really big thing with all that information. But then that gets to be like very computationally big thing because you have like so many different values you could take, right? It's an exponential thing um, in the number of frames. So that also leads to something that's very hard to learn and the label model goes crazy with complexity. But if you actually like model sequences and their correlations, then you can be a lot more clever and sort of get the best of, of all of that. You can be both pretty efficient, but then you also get to take advantage of this information. And then eventually, if you're really clever, you can be super efficient, which is what Dan's referring to in the in the follow-up paper to this one. Cool. So uh, in order to take the advantage of sequential information, like uh, for example, can you use like a sequential model as LF or uh, a model? That could be uh, one example of you taking advantage of sequential information. Yeah, exactly. That, that was exactly the idea of the multi-resolution which are these labeling functions that don't just have a single, potentially like one or more frames or one or more sort of levels. And that was the whole multi-resolution there. So the simplest kind is the one that takes advantage of the difference between a pair of frames. Um, just like how traditional video compression works by looking at what changes from one frame to the next, we can do the same thing here, compute that difference and then write a labeling function over that difference. But then sometimes you want to go even fancier and look at a whole you know, interval of time and see what's constant across the interval or do even more clever things than that. And we did a bunch of kind of trial runs of these different kinds of labeling functions for this paper. Dan, do you have some examples in mind for the kind of stuff that we wrote? Yeah, um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the figure that we had had some you know, good, good stuff on it, like uh, if you're trying to detect an interview with Bernie Sanders, a great signal is, is Bernie Sanders on screen. Um, but the the thing is, he's not always on screen when they're interviewing him. Um, so one thing, so uh, our data set was kind of from the 2016 election cycle. So sometimes they would be interviewing Bernie Sanders and put Hillary Clinton up screen because they were like asking him about something or another. Um, and sometimes, you know, they would just cut to like some B-roll footage or something like that. Um, yeah, and uh, so so it was really useful to have like a uh, signal. Oh, his face was on screen like so somewhere before. Um, and then we had kind of other labeling functions that kind of operated at different levels of, of abstraction. Like um, if there's a commercial on screen, that's obviously not the interview anymore. Uh, one of the labeling functions on there was, uh, is this the state of the union? Um, because a lot of these politicians actually go on to Jake Tapper's show um, to which I don't know if it's still called state of the union, but at the time it was called state of the union. Um, and so that was actually, you know, a non-trivial signal that uh, if you see him on screen for some amount of time, he's probably being interviewed. Whereas on some other channels, on some other networks um, that just don't do interviews, uh, that, you know, uh, that, that, that's a strong signal. Um, trying to think of anything else. Uh, oh, this frame differencing thing that Fred was talking about, that's, you know, big in shot detection where, you know, the strongest signal is, you know, if the frame is like super blue one second and then like the next second super red, you probably cut or you're in the middle of like some explosion or something. Um, and you can kind of look at, you know, how much the frames are changing from frame to frame. Um, take kind of like a moving average and see, you know, is this like a more unexpected change? Um, like, is the change from explosion or is the change from like cutting from, from one place to the next? 
Also, that's really helpful. One, one thing I'm also curious about is I imagine the types of LFs you're able to write are very different across data sets, data sets especially those that are more human interpretable versus some of the more you know, domain driven ones or, or some that maybe you don't have much domain expertise on. So I'm curious, how did this look like say across, uh, uh, you know, you shared a little bit on the, on the TV news data sets. How did those compare to ones maybe on the, you know, the gate data set, which I imagine, you know, I, I'm not a sensor expert either. So I, I don't know if I could write some domain driven uh -huh. LFs or even the BOV, BAV one, right? Where maybe right. you and I don't have that expertise, but, but an expert might, what did that difference look like in supervision signal? Yeah, so if I remember the, the BAV and the gate correctly, yeah. So, you know, full disclosure, I'm also not a medical expert. <laughs> so uh, it was a lot of, you know, uh, uh, trying to interpret what these things are supposed to say. Uh, for the BAV, so those are videos of like, uh, like an MRI of a heart. Um, so it was a lot of, uh, and I, the, the specific task is you want to look at the aorta and say, uh, does it have a very particular like genetic defect in it? Um, so those labeling functions were uh, all things like find a circle in the uh, in in the image. How circular is the circle? How big is the circle? Is there like uh, is there like some sort of like visual line through the circle? Like almost like old school computer vision um, type uh, type things. Um, and for the gate, you know, that's all over like time series. So it was all like uh, uh, stuff like, you know, you have some signal that, that looks like this. And then um, I think uh, the, the domain experts, um, you know, they, they stare at those signals all day and they're like, oh, we kind of look for like this, like distances between peaks or, or something like that um, in, in like the, the time series signal. So yeah, it was definitely very, very different. Um, uh, and I, you know, I think part of the flexibility of like the multi-resolution thing is that, uh, depending on what type of domain expertise you can get, um, you, you can actually, you know, do, do, uh, you know, it's, you, you may like what you can express, um, may change quite a bit. Um, and just being, the, having the flexibility to model those, those different things was, was really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. I actually have a, a remaining question right here. So the result table uh, right here has a prop or proportion of positive labels, uh, but the paper didn't discuss much about it. But do you have something that's worth sharing or just one with the basic information about the, the, about the data set? Uh, I think that uh, in the results table, that's largely there for like informational purposes. So we're reporting like F1 score and all of these. So it's just, just useful to, you know, for, for the audience to understand kind of what like, uh, you know, BAV 7% positive. So the F1 is, you know, can be much more informative than accuracy or something. Um, that stuff, it does play a role kind of when you look at the sequence prior. Um, so if uh, just like, you know, when you write down your prior, uh, if your event only happens like 1% of the time, you shouldn't say, if you write down the prior that it's going to happen like 70% of the time, you're getting like crazy results. Um, so that that proportion, uh, uh, you, you need to use it when you kind of like set the values of your sequential prior. Um, but yeah, I think it's mostly there in this paper for like, in this table, sorry, for like informational purposes and things like that. I see, it. got it. So that's probably all the question that I have up front. We can open questions from the other panelists or even from the floor. I can share a funny anecdote. <laughs> uh, I, I'm actually not sure how funny it will be, but, but I can try. Um, so, Okay, maybe I'll, I'll try to lower it. It's not gonna be that funny. <laughs> um, so the, this is kind of completely unrelated to, to the paper um, almost, but uh, now I was reading about the, uh, you know, the woman who kind of spent her life's work like building like mRNA vaccine type things. Um, and one of the things that jumped out to me about that work, uh, about the, it was like a New York Times prof profile or something. And one of the things that jumped out to me is she said, uh, I really love eating like, 
chocolate covered cashews or like chocolate covered peanuts. And after, uh, after we found out that mRNA vaccines worked, uh, I had like an entire box of chocolate. I ate an entire box of chocolate covered peanuts. And the reason that I found this amusing and the reason I think Fred is laughing right now is when we were writing this paper, I think we went through multiple boxes of like chocolate covered almonds or something like that. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's my primary memory of working on this paper, just eating lots of, uh, lots of snacks. You have to have a high energy chocolate bar to write this paper. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, one, one other question that I have for you is, uh, you know, how, how, did, um, how did your choice of end model um, impact the, your, your end-to-end pipelines? Because I imagine this is also, you know, very data set dependent. Um, in some cases, I also imagine it was more challenging, right, to, to model um, the end model. Did you find some cases where, hey, actually, like, the normal generalization benefits that we see in these weak supervision settings are maybe less less obvious, um, you know, in, in some data sets or or another. Um, and in general, yeah, we would love to hear how you kind of thought about bringing that into, um, you know, the, the scope of combining multiple supervision sources. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. Uh, it's it's not something that we spent a ton of time looking into in this paper because um, the focus was more on the data modeling side and things like that. Um, so uh, there, there are definitely some tasks where if you use the wrong end model, like nothing is going to work. So for example, shot detection, uh, it is impossible to tell whether you're at the beginning of a shot from a single frame. So like a standard ResNet 50 isn't going to cut it. So for that, we you know we went to like a standard 3D ResNet. Um, but I think in this paper, for the most part, we were kind of like, you know, pick the simplest model that kind of makes sense. For, so for a lot of the image data set or for a lot of the visual data sets, uh, it was, you know, your standard ResNet 50, uh, unless we needed, you know, for shot detection, it was like a 3D ResNet 18 or something like that. Um, so I, I don't, we, we didn't like spend a, a ton of time kind of like varying those models for this paper. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a great question. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, appreciate it. I feel like, there, there, you know, just thinking from the system perspective, right? There, there are so many really interesting inputs and and kind of knobs, right? That you would expect maybe a user to tune from. Hey, what what kind of uh, primitives, right? Do you expose to users so they can write labeling functions over? That's also domain specific. Um, you know, the 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 labeling functions themselves, the choice of end model, whether you know in some cases you need an end model or not. Um, so, I, I totally agree. These are really really. Um, interesting questions uh, uh, to put it into, you know, real users' hands. Right, yeah. Awesome. Well, I actually want to monopolize this time. Any any other questions from uh, panelists or, or attendees in the audience? Uh, feel free to ping, ping the chat or, or just uh, speak up, but if not, uh, could we keep going. <laughs> I can insert another short anecdote. <laughs> Please do. Uh, I think this was, you know, I, Fred, correct me if I'm wrong. I think this was the last conference that we went to in person before COVID hit um, for a lot of us because this was near 2019. Yeah, um, so. yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that, that was a fun experience. That was a very grim uh, anecdote to answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not as fun as the, uh, the original chocolate one. Um, no, no. But no, it makes sense. So I, I mean, talking even a little bit higher level, right? I, I know that you know, Dan. This is a this is a big kind of direction that you've been pushing and, and leading on the research side for a little bit of a while. Curious to hear what you're thinking in terms of you know next steps. Where are your specific uh, uh, you know interests and, and curiosities are taking you, and um, you know what what directions you're seeing on the academic side and and also on the kind of more applied side, right? Like where you're seeing certain gaps where, um, you know, th there might be a missing link right between what y'all are working on academically versus what people are, are doing in practice. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I can kind of, you know, give paint a little bit of a picture of kind of like where this uh, research direction took us. And, you know, because I'm a PhD student, it's very wandering and uh, it takes a very you know, wandering path. Um, 
So I think I mentioned briefly, like the follow-up work to this was Flying Squid, um, where, uh, you know, Dugong is, is a pretty slow software package. So we, we kind of spent some time thinking uh, and working on the algorithmic side to, to speed it up a bunch. Um, and once we had done that, it was uh, a couple of things kind of became clear. So one exciting thing was the fast iteration speed was, was really interesting. Um, and when you start looking at the fast iteration speed, the, the other thing in the pipeline that takes a lot of time is training that end model. So if I can iterate on my label uh, on, on all you know, our, our labeling functions super quickly, um, but then like I need to like run a model overnight to like kind of get the final performance. And uh, you know, sometimes those aren't perfectly correlated. Like sometimes I can have like really good labeling functions and I get like five extra points on my labeling functions, but maybe that doesn't actually teach the model that much. So uh, you, the, there's this like long cycle between uh, you know, writing your labeling functions and seeing what the end performance is. Um, and that's kind of the thing that we were looking at next after that. Um, and at the same time, kind of what was kind of coming online was uh, all these like big pre-trained models were starting to get like a lot of traction. Um, so Google had just come out with a paper uh, in the vision space. Uh, this was right around when like GPT-3 blew up um, uh, a bit prior to like Clip and all, and all those other things. But we were starting to think, is it possible to like maybe use these embeddings to, to kind of as an extra source of signal, kind of like weaker and weaker forms of supervision. Um, so, so we wrote a, a little paper also with Fred, um, trying to like use pre-trained embeddings um, to kind of like, uh, you know, can we get like some of the benefits of the end model without actually having to train something from scratch? Um, and our idea was pretty simple, you know, take a labeling function and then see like kind of nearby points using the embedding space uh, to, to try to like extend its coverage or something like that. Um, and the immediate thing that we, we learned was that when it worked, it worked good. Like, so in, in some examples, we were able to get like, uh, like uh, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but a, a good amount of lift, um, like as much lift as you would have got from training an end model um, without ever having to train anything. So. Uh, it was, you know, do a bit of pre-processing and now your iteration speed for the whole thing is like seconds. Um, and that was really exciting. But uh, as a researcher, the, the thing that we noticed is that there are other examples where the embeddings were like utterly useless. Um, like uh, a good example was uh, we, we came across a tennis data set, um, which, you know, we just downloaded some Wimbledon videos off the internet. Uh, and our task was we wanted to check exactly when somebody was hitting a ball. Um, and like a standard ResNet embedding just wasn't very useful for that um, because it's kind of like a very fine-grained action, very, very small. Um, so the question that I kind of got interested in was how do you improve these embeddings? What can you do? Um, so that's kind of what I've been working on uh, more recently, kind of on the representation learning side. Um, uh, we've been uh, playing around with you know, contrastive learning now for, for the past few months. Um, and it's, it's been really fun just trying to see you know, what, what can you learn in a self-supervised or semi-supervised way? Uh, how do you, like, how do you like fix those mistakes um, and kind of like improve the, the representation learning process? Um, so that, that's kind of like where, where my like wandering research path has gone, <laughs> um, uh, in, in the follow-up since, awesome. since this work. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's awesome here. Obviously really, really, uh, relevant to, you know, Hey, where, where do, where do users experts kind of inject, you know, their, their, their knowledge to, uh, uh, improve their systems, right. As a whole, I think that's super exciting. We'll, we'll have to have you on another time to <laughs> follow up on, uh, what, what y'all have been thinking about there. Um, yeah, yeah. But that's awesome. Cool. Well, um, I'll, I'll have a last call for, uh, for questions, but we're, we're coming up on time and I uh, don't want to keep people on, on a Friday. So uh, if there's any other questions, speak now. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it was, it was uh, lovely, lovely having you, Dan and, Dan and Freda, on the call. Thank you, Haramu, for summarizing uh, this, this paper. And yeah, we're excited to follow up in other conversations. This was this was a lot of fun, and excited to create more space for uh, 
these kinds of you know lab style chats it it, it does bring me back to those dates and uh what gates uh 40 something and you know an actual whiteboard so um, this was a lot of fun yeah this was a ton of fun uh you know next time i'll prepare more anecdotes about candy <laughs> yeah it makes a lot of sense awesome um, well, thank you everyone again. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you for the next uh, ML whiteboard every Friday. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Hey guys.